10 Entertainment Careers Cut Short by Unsolved Mysteries The world of entertainment has had its fair share of unsolved mysteries, many of which have involved some very prominent figures. For example, the murders of famous rap artists Tupac Shakur and the notorious B.I.G. are still unsolved. While the death of Kurt Cobain was ruled to be a suicide, there has always been speculation that he was actually murdered. But on the other side of the coin, there's the Black Dahlia, Elizabeth Short, an aspiring actress who was a complete unknown until she became of one of the most famous murder victims of all time. Here are 10 more lesser known entertainment figures whose careers were cut short by an unsolved mystery, whether it be a murder, an unexplained disappearance, or a suspicious suicide. In some cases, the victim's career never even got the chance to hit its peak and they wound up achieving fame because of the infamous mystery surrounding them. 1. Bobby Fuller The death of Bobby Fuller, who would have been 68 today, remains among the more perplexing mysteries in rock and roll lore. We take a look back at his life and career. Born Robert Gaston Fuller on October 22, 1942, in Baytown, Texas, Fuller grew up as a big fan of another Texas musician named Buddy Holly. He played in numerous bands with his younger brother Randy and even built his own primitive backyard recording studio. In 1961 they began releasing singles through New Mexico-based Yucca Records, and their efforts charted on local radio stations in El Paso. Fuller and his brother moved to Los Angeles and reformed the band. In 1964, the Bobby Fuller Four were signed by Mustang Records in a deal put together by Bob Keane, who'd also worked with Richie Valens and would later put out records by artists like The Surferies and Frank Zappa. The band was a bit of a throwback. While the British Invasion and Motown dominated the airwaves, the Bobby Fuller Four played what was basically 1950s style rock, inspired by the likes of Little Richard. Eddie Cochran and the Everly Brothers. Still, the group managed to chart with Let Her Dance in 1966. In a bizarre promotional turn, they appeared in the movie The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini, starring Nancy Sinatra and Boris Karloff, where they lip-synced two songs by another band. Their biggest hit came with I Fought the Law. Though Fuller is most closely associated with the song, it was actually written by Sonny Curtis and first recorded by the Crickets after Buddy Holly had died. Curtis also wrote the theme from the Mary Tyler Moore show. Today I Fought the Law has become a punk rock staple, being covered by The Clash, The Dead Kennedys, The Ramones, Social Distortion and Green Day. The version recorded by The Clash was recently included on the popular rock band video game. But Fuller wouldn't live long enough to reap many benefits from the song's success. On July 18, 1966, he was found dead inside his car at the age of 23. The L.A. County coroner's report said, deceased was found lying face down in front seat of car a gas can, one third full, cover open windows were all rolled up and doors shut, not locked keys not in ignition. He had multiple bruises on his arms and shoulders and his body was soaked with gasoline. Other witnesses report that one of his fingers was broken. Fuller's death was first ruled a suicide, but three months later, the medical examiner changed the cause of death to accidental asphyxiation. Positing, in other words, that he had somehow accidentally drowned himself in gasoline. The investigation was botched from the start, the crime scene left unsecured, no fingerprints taken from the gasoline can found in the car. Many believed Fuller had been murdered and the perpetrator, S. had fled just as they were about to torch his car to destroy the evidence. A partner of Bob Keane reputedly had mob connections, and the record company was involved in payola scams, to be fair, so was nearly everyone else in the business. There was also the matter of a large life insurance policy allegedly taken out on Bobby Fuller by this same record company investor. Another theory was that Fuller had gone to an LSD party, he'd recently started experimenting with a drug, and an accident had befallen him. Worried they'd be held responsible, and busted for drugs to boot party-goers drove him back to his apartment and left his body in the car. There's even been speculation that Charles Manson was involved. The Bobby Fuller for guitarist Jim Reese told an interviewer that four days after Bobby died, three armed men came to his apartment looking for him. The next day, Reese and drummer Dalton Powell fled to El Paso, taking along a loaded pistol just in case. With scant physical evidence, no clear leads and so much time gone by, it's doubtful we'll ever know what really happened. 
we're left to wonder what other great music Bobby Fuller might have brought into the world had he not been taken from it that July night 50 years ago. 2. Christ a Helm, The Last Take, Christ a Helm, an aspiring Hollywood actress, was murdered on February 12, 1977, when she was stabbed and bludgeoned outside her agent's home in West Hollywood. Christ who enjoyed the Hollywood life and parties, and according to her daughter hung out with lots of famous people, like Joan Amath, Mick Jagger, Warren Beatty and even the Shah of Iran. But as correspondent Maureen May reports, Christ who also kept a loved diary, as well as tape recordings of her encounters with the rich and famous. Did the diary and recordings play a role in her murder? Or was she just a victim of a random crime? Investigators are still trying to solve the mystery. After more than 30 years, Christa's daughter hopes a fresh look by police will finally crack this case and bring the killer to justice. She had a charisma that was just overwhelming. She had warmth that made people drawn to her on a regular basis. She was powerful and strong and took no bull. She was a very complicated, beautiful human being, remembers Christa's daughter Nicole, who doesn't want 48 hours to mention her last name or reveal where she lives because her mother's killer has never been caught. And, says Nicole, her mother was born to be a star. From the time she was a little girl, she would dance and sing and tell everyone she was gonna be a movie star when she grew up, and of course in Little Milwaukee Wiss, no one believed her. Smart, sexy and stunningly beautiful, Christa was the classic small-town girl with a big Hollywood dream. She was determined to become a star and she had the energy and unyielding ambition to make it happen. We had a saying between the two of us, all's fair in love and war and she lived by those words. Nothing would really stop her from getting what she wanted, remembers Christa's longtime friend Darlene Thoris. Not even a shotgun wedding would stop her, when Christa was just 17 years old. She was a teenager. He owned a karate studio, they were married in Chicago, and the morning after their wedding she woke up in their honeymoon suite and my father was gone, Nicole says. That was in 1967. Nicole was born a few months later, but within a couple of years, her young and ambitious mother grew restless and took off to follow her dream. The first stop was New York, where she found work as a model. Taking the city by storm would be impossible with a toddler in tow. So Nicole was left behind in the care of a good friend. But Christa promised she and Nicole would one day be together. I was supposed to be with her when I turned 10, Nicole says. Until then, Nicole was a visitor in her mother's life. Her model good looks and splashy personality made Christ to a natural for New York's party scene in the early 1970s. If she walked into a room, if everyone in the room hadn't stopped to notice her walk in, then she would come back in again and get it right, remembers Christa's sister Marissa Ram, who was also a sometime actress, and was often at Christa's side. One of the first people Christa met in New York was a wealthy patron of the arts named Stuart Duncan. He took an interest in Christa's career, opening doors for her. She was throwing parties for big names, the Rolling Stones. She actually got Bachelorette of the Month with Cosmopolitan. There were definitely big figures in her life, Marissa says. The Shah of Iran she dated and he sent her jewels. Christ who also picked up a fancy new best friend for life, a flamboyant New York clothing designer named Lenny Barin. And then in 1973, Christ got the break she'd been waiting for, Stuart Duncan gave her a starring role in a movie called Let's Go for Broke. The movie opened in Cincinnati in 1974 and promptly closed in just four days. And it erred. A few months later, Christa headed straight for Hollywood, where she landed bit roles in Wonder Woman and Starsky and Hutch. Nicole remembers visiting her mother at a Beverly Hills mansion belonging to famous financier Bernie Kornfeld. This was a spectacular mansion. It was absolutely enormous. I'd never seen anything like it, it was the first place I'd ever seen that had made squatters, Nicole remembers. Christa was not only ambitious and adventurous, she also liked to keep score. Her friends say she kept a secret sex diary, complete with a rating system. 3. David Bacon. David G. G. Bacon died on the afternoon of September 12, 1943, at the age of 29 with many secrets, a secret diary kept in code, coded annotations in his address book and the most of all a secret hideaway about a mile from his home. 
Bacon appeared in Republic's Masked Marvel serial, so I'll call it the Masked Marvel murder. The area of Los Angeles where he died was fairly rural in the 1940s, with little besides bin fields and roadside watermelon stands along Washington Boulevard, so Lorraine Smith, who lived at 1006 Harrison Street, had a clear view of the maroon-colored British auto, apparently with right-hand drive, which will be important later, weaving east on Washington. She said, I saw the little car wavering along the street. First it nosed into the curb on the south side of the street. Then it went diagonally across the street, over the north curb and into the bin field. Another neighbor, Wayne Powell, 1022 Harrison Street, went to the car after it crashed. A man in blue denim shorts and with the upper portion of his body bare staggered about 15 feet from the car, blood streaming from a wound in the left side of his back. The Times said. Powell said, I knelt beside him and he whispered please help me two times and then he died. He was just lying there between two bin stacks, kicking and squirming. I told him to lie still and save his energy. Before he died, I asked him who had done it but he couldn't say. Later investigation showed that the wound was five inches deep and three quarters of an inch wide, probably made with a commando-style knife, according to police. From the position of the wound, police believed he was struck without warning as he leaned forward in the car, possibly to close a door, the Times said. United Press writer Frederick C. Ethman noted in a September 14, 1943, story, only surmise of the police was that Bacon may have picked up a hitchhiker, who stabbed him when he leaned forward, possibly to release the parking brake. This theory sounded phony, even to the officers who propounded it, and they urged reporters to think up a better one, or page inspector, Ellery, Queen. According to a September 15, 1943, story by the Associated Press, Dr. Frank R. Webb, county autopsy surgeon, said the wound five and one half to six inches deep, had struck the lower sac of the heart and caused a hemorrhage of the left lung. A man with a wound like that might have lived 20 minutes, Webb said. A third witness, Mrs. B. Watterson, 2335 Washington Boulevard, said she had passed the car just before the crash and had seen a man in a dark suit sitting next to the driver. Watterson's comments in Othman's story are particularly interesting, she noticed them particularly, she said, because the driver appeared to be naked. His companion, she reported, was dark clad. A man at a service station about a half mile west of the crash told police that he had seen a man and woman in the car. Items found in the victim's wallet identified him as movie actor David G. G. Bacon, 28, 8444 Magnolia Avenue. The car was registered to his wife, singer Greta Keller, who was about five months pregnant. According to news reports, the interior of the car was soaked with blood but there wasn't a drop on the exterior, supporting the idea that he had been stabbed while in the vehicle. A bathrobe found in the car was also soaked with blood but there was no knife mark, so investigators believed Bacon hadn't been wearing it when he was stabbed. The various parts of the interior bore many fingerprints, all Bacon's, according to an Associated Press story. The upholstery was smeared with blood and there were a few smears on the steering wheel. Officers said Bacon's shorts were dry indicating he had not been in the water, but said some sand clung to them as though he had been lolling on the beach, the app said. Police discounted robbery as a motive, noting that there was $13 in his wallet and that he was wearing two valuable rings. The only clue was a crewneck sweater with several blonde hairs, which Powell took from the car and placed under Bacon's head as he was dying. Investigators found that the sweater was too small to fit Bacon and speculated that it might have belonged to the killer. 4. Tammy Lynn Leppert. Amy, some sources also spell her name as Tammy, Lynn Leppert was an 18-year-old beauty pageant queen, model, and aspiring actress who vanished on July 6, 1983 after a series of bizarre events. After filming a bit part for the movie Spring Break in July 1982, Tammy began to exhibit troubling behavior. When the movie completed filming, Tammy went on chaperone to a weekend party. She came back a different person. According to Wing, a family friend, Tammy's behavior began to take on paranoid overtones. Sometimes I'd ask her, what was on her mind, if anything was bothering her. And she'd usually change the subject or she'd say, oh, nothing you know and then try to laugh it off. Even more disturbingly, Tammy expressed fears that someone was trying to kill her. 
According to Tammy's mother, then she said mom, what would you say if I told you somebody was trying to kill me? I just took a deep breath, and I said, do you think somebody is trying to kill you, Tammy? She said, yes. Tammy began to isolate herself, and in March 1983 her paranoia escalated while on the set of the film Scarface. According to a family friend who Tammy had been staying with while in Miami, I received a call from the casting director to tell me that Tammy had a breakdown on the set. They said that it was a scene where someone was supposed to be shot and had artificial blood spurt out. And they said when Tammy was watching the scene, she started crying hysterically and it got so bad that they had to take her to a trailer. She was in a tremendous state of fear, anxiety. What it was that caused this great fear in her I don't know. When I spoke with Tammy's mother, I told her that she should take Tammy to a doctor and also take her to the police to find out if the problem was psychological or if there was some basis in fact that someone was actually trying to kill her and get to the bottom of it. After quitting the film and returning home to Florida, Tammy's mother insisted that she report her concerns to the police. However, when meeting with law enforcement Tammy did not mention that she felt her life was in danger. Her paranoia continued, with days when she was almost normal, and there were other days when she was real edgy. On July 1st, Tammy's behavior erupted when she smashed all the windows in her home and attacked a longtime family friend named Wing Flanagan. Tammy's mother checked her into a mental health facility, where an evaluation revealed that Tammy was not abusing drugs or alcohol. She was released after a 72-hour observation. The following day, Tammy and a friend drove to the local beach, when according to Detective Jim Scrav the Cocoa Beach, Florida Police Department, they started to argue, this friend picked her up at her home and they drove to the beach. And we talked to him. And he basically stated that they'd become involved in a verbal argument. She had requested that he let her out near the glass bank in Cocoa Beach and he complied. Tammy's friend said he dropped her off about five miles from her house. She was barefoot and carried no purse. According to Detective Scrap, it was the last time Tammy Lynn would be seen alive, she disappeared without a trace. We talked to some of her close friends. They felt strongly that Tammy was having problems at home and dot 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 she wanted to leave home. There has been speculation that Tammy was abducted by Christopher Wilder, a serial killer active in the Florida area who targeted models. Tammy's family filed a million dollar lawsuit against Wilder, but the suit was later dropped. It is worth noting that Wilder did not start his killing spree until a year after Tammy vanished. To this day no one has seen or heard from Tammy, and is unknown whether her paranoia was the result of delusions or actual events. Her sister continues to search for her, and is active on many social networking sites dedicated to missing individuals, including Web Sleuths and an Unsolved Mysteries forum. 5. Barbara Colby. By the early 1970s, Barbara was a bi-coastal actress appearing in TV guest shots. She was often typecast as the prostitute or wench. She made her 1971 primetime debut on Columbo in Murder by the Book. She played Lily Lasanka, a love-starved hopelessly inept blackmailer who gets bumped off by Jack Cassidy. Episodes of Medical Center, Kung Fu and Gunsmoke followed. Barbara's buddy Jack Klugman suggested her for the part of a cynical, and funny resort bartender in a 1971 episode of The Odd Couple. Barbara continued her stage career and appeared in the plays, House of Blue Leaves, The Hotel Baltimore and Murderous Angels with Lou Gossett. She also got two small movie roles in California Split, and in her actress, writer friend Ellen Gere's Memory of Us. In her mid-thirties, Barbara's career was really taking off, but her marriage to Bob Levitt Six was ending and a divorce was in the works. Barbara's sister Renee said, they were the kind of couple that you hear is breaking up and can't fathom it. I don't think Bob shared all of her metaphysical pursuits. I sense Barbara moved on with life faster than he did. It was a loving mutual split. In 1975, with the success of MTM spin-off Rhoda, Clarice Leachman was given a spin-off for her self-absorbed scatterbrained character Phyllis Lindstrom. In the new sitcom, Phyllis would be suddenly widowed and forced to work at a commercial photography studio in her hometown of San Francisco. MTM wanted Barbara Colby to play Phyllis boss Julie Erskine. She took the role and three episodes were completed. Barbara's sister Renee shared, the comedy thing was new for her. She preferred the live theater I think, because it's more challenging to make it through without stopping. 
she was good at the comedy thing dot 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 but it was new. When you watch Phyllis, that character Julie is Barbara. Those smiles she gives to Phyllis after teaching her some lesson. That's Barbara. Despite Barbara being 14 years younger than Clarice Leachman, it was not hard for audiences to accept her as this worldly, wise, good-humored mentor and contemporary of Phyllis. On Thursday night July 24, 1975, Barbara was about 30 miles from her Topanga Canyon home teaching an acting class in Venice, California, according to the LA Times. At about 11.50 p.m., she and her actor companion James Keenan were walking to their car parked in this lot. It was normal for Barbara and pals to congregate in the parking lot after class and talk. Her friend actor Ron Rifkin would have been the two, but he stayed homesick that evening. They were approached by two black men in a light-colored van. Barbara and James were shot once. Neither were robbed. Police received a call just before midnight, stating that a man was heard screaming, and then gunshots. When police arrived, Barbara was dead at the scene. A small caliber bullet had entered her left arm and chest, perforating her left lung. She was 35 years old. Before he died from his gunshot wound at David Brotman Memorial Hospital at 1.32 a.m., James Keenan gave police the details of their brutal unprovoked attack. The day after the shooting, LA Times reported, in a violent 40 minutes, two women and a man were murdered and six other people were threatened, molested or robbed Thursday night in three separate street attacks in the West Los Angeles Santa Monica area. By Monday, LA Times headlines warned, homicides doubled, high crimes up 14% and police beef up force after five murders. Six young men were soon arrested and questioned after the crime spree, but they were cleared with no connection found to Barbara's murder. The case was never solved. 6. Millennia Carisi. Getting lost in New Orleans has long had a certain cachet. The people who live here say the city is unique, the food spicier, the music livelier, the mysteries stranger. But the mystery of a missing Italian traveler is distinctive even by New Orleans standards. The main characters are a former American matinee idol's granddaughter and a mesmerizing street musician. The scene is the waterfront and the streets of the French Quarter. Swirling in the background is the blend of Spanish, French and African cultures that has drawn writers like Lafcadia Hearn and William Faulkner. The Italian news media, which has recounted every twist of the mystery on newscasts and in newspapers, has even hinted of voodoo. Semi-celebrity in Italy, Milenia Carisi, a 23-year-old blonde with green eyes, disappeared on January 6, a week after arriving here, leaving behind her passport and some baggage. That night a young woman, whose body has never been found, jumped into the Mississippi River at the edge of the French Quarter and vanished. The questions she left behind are still unanswered. Miss Carisi is a minor television celebrity in Italy, for a short time a counterpart of Vanna White on an Italian game show. But she is best known as the daughter of two Italian singers, Albano and Romina Power, and as the granddaughter of the American actor Tyrone Power and his actress wife, Linda Christian. Miss Carisi and her parents came to New Orleans on vacation last July, says Fabrizio Mazza, the Italian consul here, and Miss Carisi met a street musician, Alexander Masekla, a 54-year-old cornet player with a Jamaican accent. Enchanted by the city and apparently by Mr. Masekla, Miss Carisi stayed behind when her parents went on to Florida, saying she wanted to write and paint. According to accounts in the Italian news media, as described by Dr. Matza, Miss Carisi rushed to Florida two days later, telling her parents that she feared that two men were trying to drug and kill her. Nevertheless, Miss Carisi, who was on leave from her studies at the University of London, returned to New Orleans on December 30. The Times Picayune, New Orleans' main newspaper, quoted Miss Power as saying that her daughter wanted to find characters for a book she was writing. The young woman mingled with street musicians and the homeless, and took notes. She stayed with Mr. Massacre in a scruffy hotel on St. Charles Street, five blocks from the French Quarter, where Mr. Massacre played his cornet for donations. Mike Stark, who owns a French Quarter mask and hat store called The Little Shop of Fantasy, said that some homeless people he knows told him Miss Carisi worked very hard at being a street person. On Gen 6. At 11 p.m., a young woman jumped into the Mississippi River near the Aquarium of the Americas, on the edge of the French Quarter. 
Shortly before, she had told a security guard, I belong in the water. The woman swam through the fast brown currents about 100 yards toward the middle of the river. A barge then came by, making waves. The woman screamed for help and then vanished. The Coast Guard searched 90 miles of the river, almost to the Gulf of Mexico, and found only the body of an unidentified man. Lure of the river, the security guard, Albert Cordova, has tentatively identified photos of Miss Carisi as depicting the woman who spoke to him. It's not the first time someone tried to swim across the river, Mr. Stark said, and they didn't show up either. There is a magic about that river. People who've been drinking too much can believe, I can swim that damn thing. Miss Carisi's parents last heard from their daughter on January 1st, and despite her apparent drowning, they say they fear she is being held hostage. On February 18th they issued a statement from Switzerland, which Dr. Matza translated as saying, the investigations to find our daughter alive, and probably held against her will, are actively being pursued. It also said there have been numerous and reliable sightings worthy of pursuit. That very week, for example, came an unconfirmed report that Miss Carisi had been seen in St. Augustine, Florida colleague drops from view. Mr. Masekla has not been accused of any wrongdoing, but Miss Carisi's parents say they are suspicious of him. He had some kind of power over her, Miss Power said at a New Orleans news conference after her daughter vanished. Mr. Masekla has no official address and has proved elusive in recent weeks, but in an interview published in late January in the Times Picayune, he said of Miss Carisi, I believe she is safe. The police say only that the investigation is continuing. The mystery has caught the imagination of New Orleans residents, who note that it would not be the first time a stranger has come to the city and disappeared from her previous life. As Mr. Stark puts it, New Orleans is a magical town that attracts many people who are trying to escape from wherever they've been. 7. Peter Rivers. Peter Rivers was endlessly accomplished, with legions of devoted friends. Now, 25 years after his mysterious murder, the lost legacy of his life is being reclaimed. Peter Rivers was freakishly gifted on the harmonica. None other than Muddy Waters, in the midst of a 1968 jam at Cambridge Blues Club, proclaimed him to be the greatest harp player alive. His debut album, Night of the Blue Communion, Epic, 1969, is considered a forgotten masterpiece of outre psychedelia. As a student technical director and score writer at Harvard's Loeb Theatre, he was close with such actors as John Lithgow, Tommy Lee Jones, and Stockard Channing. His best friend was Harvard Lampoon editor and National Lampoon founder, Doug Kenny, who would go on to co-write Animal House and Caddyshack. His band opened for Fleetwood Mac. He was asked by David Lynch to co-write In Heaven, the lady in the radiator song, for a raise ahead. He was good pals with John Belushi and Harold Ramis. As co-creator of the LA-based UHF former TV show New Wave Theater, he brought punk bands, including Dead Kennedys and the Circle Jerks, into the living rooms of America. You've probably never heard of Peter Rivers, but the Brookline-born, Roxbury Latin and Harvard-educated free spirit, a sort of zealot of the late 60s to early 80s pop cultural scene, who was murdered in 1983, was a one-of-a-kind talent, says Josh Frank, Cawther, with Charlie Buckholtz, of In Heaven Everything Is Fine, The Unsolved Life of Pete Rivers and the Lost History of New Wave Theatre, Free Press. If anyone's story deserves to be told, it's Peter's. Ivers was endlessly accomplished. He was well loved by all who knew him, be they Hollywood hire owners or bile spitting punks. And his promise was snuffed out far too soon. He did more in his 36 years than any pop star that gets press daily for brushing their teeth, says Frank. He inspired all the top people from the world of film and TV and music. You name anybody, and they either knew Peter or their best friend knew Peter. And the reason he didn't get a chance to shine was not because he was less talented than the others, in fact most of them would say, compared to Peter, I'd done nothing back then. But then he was murdered. What do we do, Starsky? On March 3, 1983, in an artist's loft in a seedy section of Los Angeles, Peter Rivers was bludgeoned to death in his bed. Just hours later, not long after the lapped had first arrived at the murder scene, the loft was descended upon by dozens of Ivers' Hollywood friends. Harold Ramis was there. So was New Wave Theatre's co-creator, David Jove. 
Frank writes of actor Paul Michael Glazer arriving at the scene, where baffled police stood by, near panicked by the weeping, fainting crowds. Overwhelmed by the throng, losing once and for all whatever grasp of the situation they may have had. The two officers are hit with the full weight of the knowledge that they have no idea what this place is, who this person was, what it all means, or how to proceed. Glazer opens his mouth, but before he can get a question out, or even a word, one of the officers shouts his own question over the mob's raucous din, What do we do, Starsky? 8. Joe Pitchler. Former child actor Joe Pitchler, who appeared in two of the Beethoven comedies, was missing after leaving a note in his car expressing suicidal thoughts, relatives said. Well-wishers and relatives joined police, Kitsap County Water Search and Rescue Personnel and tracking dogs in unsuccessful efforts to find Pitchler, now 18, since his empty car was found last Tuesday, at an intersection above a narrow arm of water called the Port Madison Narrows. Inside the car was a note in which he wrote about wishing to be a stronger brother, and asking that his belongings go to a younger brother, his family said. Also included were a few poems. Pitchler, a native of Bremerton, was in a commercial for a Seattle department store at age six. He moved to Los Angeles and appeared in The Fan in 1996, Varsity Blues in 1999 and the third and fourth installments of the Beethoven series, featuring the humorous adventures of a Saint Bernard in 2000 and 2001. In 2002, he had a leading role in the film Children on Their Birthdays, a coming-of-age tale based on a short story by Truman Capote. His TV appearances include a part in Touched by an Angel. Bichler was last heard from at approximately 4.15am on January 5, 2006 in Bremerton, Washington, when he talked to a friend on his cellular phone. He has never been heard from again. His silver 2005 Toyota Corolla was found on January 9, 2006, near the intersection of Wheaton Way and Sheridan Road in Bremerton, half a mile from Port Madison Narrows. A photograph of the car is posted below this case summary. All of Bichler's personal belongings were left behind when he vanished, with the exception of his wallet and car keys. His apartment was unlocked and the lights were left on, which is uncharacteristic of him. Bichler is considered to be in danger. He left some poetry indicating he was feeling depressed. He stated he wished he had been a stronger brother for his younger brother and asked that his brother be given his belongings. There is no hard evidence that he took his own life, however, and Bichler's writings did not explicitly state he intended to do so. The friends who last saw him stated he was in good spirits while he was with them. Police theorized Pitchler committed suicide by jumping off a bridge into the Port Madison Narrows. But search dogs did not trace his scent to the bridge, and his family does not believe he was depressed or suicidal at the time of his disappearance. His loved ones believe Pitchler may have met with foul play. Pitchler began acting at age six and lived part-time in Los Angeles, California until 2002, pursuing acting jobs. He has been in many commercials and television shows and has also played significant roles in several movies, including The Fan the third and fourth movies in the Beethoven series, and children on their birthdays, and he has also done voiceover work. He was reportedly unhappy to have to return to his hometown of Bremerton, but settled in nicely once he got there. He received a significant amount of money from his trust fund after turning 18 and set up his own residence, but was a frequent visitor to his family's home. Two months prior to his disappearance, he had taken a full-time job as a telephone technician at Teletesh. He was also experimenting with drugs and alcohol recreationally. He had given up acting in Bremerton, but was planning on returning to California to begin his career again once his braces were removed. His family planned to support him in this endeavor. Bichler is a graduate of Bremerton High School, class of 2005. He had a pet guinea pig at the time of his disappearance and enjoyed playing the card game Magic, The Gathering. He likes food from Jack in the Box restaurants and Mexican food, particularly chips and salsa. His disappearance remains unsolved. 9. Thelma Todd. This December 16th, it will have been 73 years since Thelma Todd was found dead at 29, in the garage of her home. The car she was sitting in was still on. The exact circumstances of her death remain a mystery. Thelma Alice Todd was born on July 29, 1905 in Lawrence. M.A. She was a lively child, always good at academics, 
and she wanted to be a school teacher. In college, her mother, who wanted her to be more than a school mom, encouraged her to participate in beauty pageants. In 1925, she won the Miss Massachusetts title, and was subsequently offered movie roles. She had a gift for comedy, though she also did drama and horror roles, and starred in over 130 movies. Transitioning easily from silent to talky films, she worked with such venerated actors as Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy, Zasu Pitts and the Marx Brothers. Her bombshell look earned her the moniker, the ice cream blonde. Like many in the industry, Thelma lived fast. She had so many car crashes. The studio eventually insisted that she have a driver. She was married briefly in 1932 to 1934, a party guy, Pat Disico. Their chief entertainment appeared to be drunken brawls, one of which landed Thelma in the hospital for an emergency appendectomy. In the early 30s, Todd bought a piece of property on what is now called the Pacific Coast Highway, facing the ocean and built a structure that would double as her home, in the upstairs apartments, and Thelma Todd's sidewalk cafe, which was downstairs. The cafe was a great success, catering to the entertainment and underworld crowds. There are few facts about the death of Thelma Todd that anyone can agree on. She had purchased and was running the cafe with her boyfriend, director, Roland West. They lived above the cafe in adjoining bedrooms. The evening before her death, he admitted that they had been fighting. It was a Saturday, and that night, Thelma was driven to a party being held for her in Hollywood at Café Trocadero. It was hosted by Stanley Lupino and his daughter Ida. Her ex, Pat DeSico had requested to be seated next to her, but he arrived with a date and immediately attached himself to another group. Thelma was humiliated and fought with him. She proceeded to get quite drunk and confided to Ida she was seeing a rich businessman. Meanwhile, back at the cafe, West locked up. As was his habit, at 2 a.m., Todd left the Tricadero sometime before 3. Though people claim to have seen or heard from her early the next day, a pharmacist at 9.30 a.m., and a close friend claimed to have received a phone call, where she identified herself as Hot Toddy, a well-known nickname, to talk about a party, none of these instances can be verified. It wasn't until Monday morning around 10.30 am, that the maid found Thelma, slumped over at the wheel of her 1932 Lincoln Phaeton. Eventually, her death was ruled a suicide, though everyone said that 29-year-old Todd was in good spirits. Inconsistent facts quickly came to life. The coroner determined she died between 5 and 8 am on Sunday. She was still wearing her party clothes from Saturday night, though she had peas and carrots in her stomach, which weren't served at Tricadero. There were no signs of struggle, he fingernails were undamaged, but her nose was broken. Her sandals were clean, but the police determined that anyone climbing the outside staircase would have had dirty shoes. A number of theories arose. The most sensational was that Lucky Luciana had been pressing Thelma to turn her club into a gambling joint. When she refused, he had her off. It could have been an accident. Thelma, having been locked out of the house, went up to the garage and turned on the car to keep warm, or to go someplace, and fell asleep. But West said that she wasn't shy about waking him up when she got home and a key to the house was found on her person. There was a rumor that West confessed on his deathbed claimed that he had unknowingly locked Todd in the garage. After her funeral, Todd was cremated, leading people to wonder if there had been a cover-up by the notoriously corrupt district attorney's office. Whatever happened, Hollywood lost a star and gained a mystery. 10. Jean Spangler Jean Elizabeth Spangler was born in Seattle, Washington on September 2, 1923 and was an American dancer, model, and bit part actress in Hollywood films and early television. She mysteriously disappeared on October 7, 1949 at the age of 26. Spangler was a divorcee and had a daughter. Christine Louise Benner, with her ex-husband Dexter Benner. Christine was born April 22, 1944 and was five years old at the time of her mother's disappearance. When the divorce was finalized, Dexter was given custody of Christine partly because of Jean's infidelity during the marriage and also because he claimed she put her partying lifestyle ahead of the needs of her daughter. Dexter denied Jean the right to see her daughter many times. It's also been said that Dexter threatened Jean, saying he could make it to where she would never see her daughter again. Jean took him to court and after a long custody battle, Jean won custody of Christine in 1948. 
The judge had ruled that Jean's questionable behavior was in the past, and that the little girl's place was with her mother. On October 7, 1949, Spangler left her home in Los Angeles where she lived with her mother and daughter at about 5 p.m. Spangler's mother was out of town at the time visiting family. Spangler left her daughter in the care of her sister-in-law, Sophie, and told her that she was going to meet with Dexter to talk about a late child support payment, and then she was going to do work on a movie set. A clerk at a store near Jean's home is the last person believed to have seen her. The clerk said that it appeared Jean was waiting for someone. There has been no confirmed sightings of her since. The next day Sophie filed a missing person report with the police. Authorities checked at the studios where Jean worked and found that none of them had any work in progress with Jean, and that in fact, none were even open the evening of October 7th when she disappeared. The police then questioned Jean's ex-husband who said that he had not seen her in several weeks and his new wife, Lynn, said that he was with her at the time of Jean's disappearance. On October 9th, two days after the disappearance, Jean's purse was found near the Ferndale entrance to Griffith Park in Los Angeles. One of the straps had been torn from the purse which lead police to believe that there could have been a burglary that took place. This was soon ruled out when Jean's sister-in-law told them that there had been no money in Jean's purse when she left her home that evening. Sixty police officers and over 100 volunteers searched the 4,107-acre park where the purse was found, but no other clues turned up. Inside the purse there was an unfinished note found that was addressed to Kirk and Reed. Can't wait any longer, going to see Dr. Scott. It will work best this way while mother is away. When Jean's mother returned from her trip she told police that someone by the name of Kirk had picked up Jean a couple of times, but that he didn't ever come in the house and instead stayed in the car. The authorities searched for Kirk and questioned every doctor in Los Angeles with the last name of Scott, but none of them had a patient by the last name of Spangler or Benner, her former married name. It was found out that Jean had been involved in an affair during her marriage to Dexter while he away serving in the military. She called this person Scotty, but broke off the relationship when he beat her and threatened to kill her if she ever left. Jean's lawyer told police that she had not seen him since 1945. Many found it strange that actor Kirk Douglas called the investigators while on vacation in Palm Springs to tell them that Jean had a small part in the then unfinished movie Young Man with a Horn that he starred in. He did this before the police even made the connection to him and told them that he was not the Kirk mentioned in the letter found in Jean's purse. Douglas was interviewed by the head investigator and said that Jean had just been an extra in the film and that he did not know her personally. In another weird twist to the story, a friend of Jean's told police that Jean had confided in her that she was three months pregnant and had talked about having an abortion, which was illegal at the time. After talking to several people who went to the same bars and nightclubs as Jean, police learned that there was a former medical student who was known as Doc and who did abortions for money. The police came up with the theory that Jean had went to him for an abortion and there were complications that she died from. They could never find this Doc or anyone who would say that they had actually met him. There were reports of Jean being spotted in Palm Springs, California with Davy O'Gill who was known to be involved with gangster Mickey Cohen. Ogil disappeared two days after Jean. The authorities had another theory that Jean and Ogil, who was under an indictment for conspiracy, had fled to avoid prosecution. In 1950, a customs agent in El Paso, Texas reported seeing Ogil and a woman who looked like Jean in a hotel. A clerk at this hotel identified Jean from a photo as having stayed in the hotel around that same time. Neither Davy O'Gill or Jean Spangler's names were on the hotel's registration records and Jean could not be located anywhere in El Paso. The Los Angeles Police Department continued the search for several years, circulating Jean's picture nationwide in a failed attempt to find her or any reliable information relating to her case. No other clues have turned up since. There were reports of people seeing her in different parts of California, Phoenix, Arizona, and Mexico City over the next couple years, but none of these sightings could be validated. To this day she is still listed as a missing person and her case has not been closed. Dexter Benner was once again granted custody of their daughter after Jean failed to reappear. Benner attempted to have his new wife adopt Christine on the grounds of abandonment, but the judge would not allow it because there was no proof as to whether Jean was alive or dead. 
Jean's mother got a court order granting her visitation rights to her granddaughter, but Dexter repeatedly disregarded it. Dexter was then ordered to serve 15 days in jail for not following the court order. He took Christine and left the state, never returning. There are reports that Dexter's new wife, Lynn, was formerly Lynn Lasky, having been married to Ely Lasky who was a close colleague of Mickey Cohen. Many believe that the sighting of her with Davy Ogule may be in some way connected since he too was an associate of Cohen, the gangster. Dexter Benner died on May 7, 2007 at the age of 87. He was survived by Lynn, his wife of 63 years, and three daughters including Christine who is now going by the last name Williams. This case leaves me with so many questions. Did the police thoroughly investigate Dexter's new wife, Lynn? Could she really have been connected to a mobster? Was there anyone else besides Lynn that could confirm where Dexter was that evening? Could she have been covering for her husband? Maybe Lynn was not connected at all. Maybe there was a Dr. Scott that was involved in a fatal abortion attempt. The police searched for a doctor by that last name, but what if Scott was actually the first name instead? Did they look into that? I also wonder what Christine's life has become. Is she still alive? How much does she know about her mother and the disappearance that surrounds her?